So this is a 1994 Subaru Legacy touring wagon. It's uh, better known just as a Subaru Legacy Turbo. Now the story on this car, it's very similar to the first car that I ever had, uh, which was a 93 sedan. This one, uh, of course, is the wagon. Nice and practical, actually. And uh, the story behind it is that I actually uh, found it for a friend when he was looking for a car many, many years ago. And uh, then the transmission died on him after he owned it for a few years. And uh, at that point, I liked it so well, and uh, he knew that, that he uh, really just signed the title on over to me because uh, it really wasn't worth a whole lot, especially not back then. Of course, nowadays, these are... Uh, even more rare than they were, you know, about five years ago. So, it's a very cool car to have. Of course, the first thing I had to do when I picked it up was uh, get the transmission replaced. Found a uh, used Subaru transmission on Craigslist. And I had a shop that I knew put it in for me. And it's worked out pretty well. It's not perfect. Still leaks, unfortunately, but that was my fault for uh, picking up a, a Craigslist transmission. No uh, fault of the shops. see it's uh it's pretty clean inside pretty clean outside too you know you've got that 90s style japanese dash the first gen legacy is real driver focused in terms of the dash everything kind of slants on over towards the the driver's position which is pretty neat One of the things that's not so neat about this car's condition is uh, you can tell the clear coat is uh, starting to fail pretty bad all over it, especially on the hood, and on the roof, any flat surface really that faces the sun all the time. And for some reason the, uh, the paint here on the door handle has decided to start peeling on me too. So this car is mostly original, but there's a few things that have been changed on it. Like I said, that transmission had to be replaced. You'll notice too, if you're a, a real astute Subaru guy, that these are actually uh, the wrong wheels for a 94. 94 came with a five spoke. These are six, like the earlier cars. And of course, these are the wrong size tires as well. I actually got this set of wheels off of some, uh, some guys out back. So that's why they're, they're the sort of big outback size tires. But they actually don't rub. Give a pretty good ride in the city and, well, it's mostly for temporary driving around on this right now anyways, just so I can move it because this is not a current daily driver. And a couple of things that are more fun that I changed though. You'll notice the headlights are actually nice and clear. These are the European market glass headlights. So there's still a left-hand drive beam pattern, but you can get up there and they're actually made of glass. So they don't fog up, which is pretty nice.
And I don't know how easily you'll be able to tell. Probably not very, since I've got a little filter on this uh, GoPro here, but currently reads 150,059 miles on the odometer. So it's, uh, it's a low mileage car, especially for a 94. One other thing that's not original about this, it's got Bug Eye WRX bucket seats in it, which are decent, but honestly I wish, uh, wish I'd kept the original seats because those are increasingly difficult to find and uh, well, I, I, I just regret that decision, but whatever, these are more comfortable for sure. They just, uh, they don't jive with the, the pattern on the rest of the interior as you can see. Let's see back there, there we go. And of course this does have the uh, much hated automatic seat belts in it until when I go ahead and sit down and maybe I'll get a better eye for the odometer there Probably the better example. They both work. Of course, this one will try to choke me out as I close the door. There we go. All right, so now let's take a look under the uh, the hood here. And so if you know anything about these cars, you'll know right away that uh, this is not stock. Good prop in place. So this is still the EJ22T 2.2 liter from the factory non-intercooled. But of course this has the uh, EJ20G, I think it is, uh, top mount intercooler, and this one in particular is off of an STI. And then, of course, we've also, and good luck with that because uh, the lighting, but if you can see that in there, that is a uh, TDO5 16G turbo also out of a Japanese market old old turbo Subaru probably a uh, version 1 2 STI I believe is what the intercooler as well as the turbo is out of so the reason that all that was done is uh, the original turbo was blowing a bunch of smoke I guess the seals in it went and uh, well, we needed something to fix it with, and finding an original VF11 is pretty difficult, considering how few of these cars they made anyway, so just picked up an upgrade along the way. And of course, in order to do that, you know, this uh, coolant overflow tank right here, it's normally up in this area, so that had to be relocated, and then all the associated hoses going across and everything had to be... Uh, routed but it works pretty well it's not the cleanest install i could definitely do better but it's been working for years of course got a uh, recirculating 
uh, bypass valve there. Try to try to limit the the choo choo noises. To be honest, keep it keep it nice and tidy. But yeah, let's start her up. So, you know, nothing too exciting. It's still a stock exhaust. Try to uh, not really go too crazy with this thing. The uh, turbo and intercooler are mostly a, uh, an opportunistic move rather than a real move for big power. It was what I had available and they're nice parts, so why not? And of course, it's uh, using a manual boost controller here, but it's set to run just about at, at stock pressure. So here's a little rundown of a few things going on in the interior. You can see it's got a, a pretty standard 90s Japanese looking gauge cluster. One of the cool things about it though is it does have this little diagram on there that actually shows you know, the, the top-down view of, of a car. Now, it's not the car, because this diagram is actually of a sedan, and of course, this is a wagon, but it still works. So whenever you go and open a door, you can see it illuminates which door is open. And then it goes off when you shut it. So see if I do the door right behind me. There you go. Over here and open the passenger door up. Same thing. So that's pretty neat. And of course, you've got you know your basic climate control with buttons for everything. And you know it's actually kind of nice because most cars of this era have you know big sliders or big knobs or whatever for the AC, and they work great, but this one's got something a, a little bit more refined. You've get, you get buttons here, and uh, it'll actually electronically change where the, uh, the airflow is directed. Now, of course, you know, woohoo, that doesn't sound that exciting nowadays, but, you know, for an early 90s car, eh, pretty good. We've got an aftermarket stereo in here. Once again, uh, this is actually, uh, th this is this is one of the, the sins that I committed in this car because I really wanted Bluetooth and the stock radio did not have that capability. Some of them came with an aux input on the stock stereo, not, not for an MP3 player, but for a CD player like a Walkman. But this one was the, uh, one of the ones that actually came with a factory CD player, so it didn't come with the aux port. So, upgraded to this unit. And yeah, it looks ugly and, you know, the, these were like a, a weird DIN size too, so it doesn't even fill in the DIN. So it's a bit of a mess, but functionally, it works great. I don't know what they're doing back there, but there's a bunch of construction equipment. You can see also that we get cup holders here. They just pull right out. Not the greatest cup holders, but you know, they'll they'll hold a can of soda or, you know, like a, a small or a medium drink. I mean, hell, if, you, if you're getting stuff at Starbucks, I think you can hold all the way up to a, a venti. 
Not sure about a Trenta though. Don't think I've ever tried it in one of these. And you know, you get your standard stuff. You got a, you got a glove box in here. Of course, you've got, you know, your center console, with the little pocket and you've got your standard automatic transmission. Now, the, when I first got my 93, way, way back when, I was very excited by this manual thing on here. And I thought, oh, manual, it's got some kind of manumatic mode. Well, no, this is just to allow you to uh, push this button and then shift into one of these lower gears here and you can force the vehicle to start believe it's either you can put it in the, the two spot or you can put it in the three spot and push this manual button and the vehicle will start in second gear and if you have it in the number three spot it'll start in second and it'll allow you to shift into third but I don't really quite understand the point considering that uh, these were all-wheel drives so if you run into a situation where you don't have enough traction to do a start in first gear how is starting in second going to help at all when you've got all-wheel drive doesn't really seem to uh, check out but some of these were available with front wheel drive so I wonder if that's just a feature that made it onto all of them in spite of the fact that uh, these are all-wheel drive and actually one of one of the things I did with this is uh, this manual button now I changed what pin on the ECU or the TCU I changed what pin on the transmission uh, control unit this actuates and so rather than grounding the pin to put this in this uh, rather useless manual mode it actually grounds a pin that's uh, previously unused and it puts the vehicle in uh, what it calls power mode which just sh changes the shift points to uh, higher revs so that was a weird feature of this transmission too if you really you know hit the throttle quick then uh, the transmission would actually uh, shift into a different shift mode and you would get higher revs out of it. The, uh, the little light down here on the dash that says power there on the left hand side would illuminate green and then your shift points would all be, uh, would all be moved up. Now this, uh, this one on the right tells you that it's in the quote unquote manual mode to start in second gear. Well now if, I, uh, if I'm driving around and I hit that button, you'll, you'll see it. Both of those lights will come on and it just change, uh, changes where the, uh, the shift points are. So, kind of neat. You know, this transmission is, uh, it's not sporty in any sense of the word. It's, it's not like a, an automatic out of a, an old, you know, M car where you get, you know, those, those real nice downshifts and it holds gears and, and it, you know, behaves like a sports car even though it's a it's a torque converter auto no this this thing actually <laughs> seems to behave a lot a lot like a CVT in the sense that you barely even feel when it's shifting it's it's very very smooth and it's actually quite nice with the turbo power plant because you get kind of a, a surge of torque and just kind of kind of cruise on that surge of torque and the revs hold right around 2,500, 3,000 RPM, and you're golden. So it's not not a sporty experience necessarily, unless you uh, you put it in that power mode, and then it'll it'll let the engine rev out before it shifts gears. One of the other things about these uh, first gen legacies is uh, you get a lot of space. I'm not really the uh, tallest guy in the world that's for sure but and i tell you what for a back seat in a japanese car especially a 90s japanese car it's pretty spacious you, know, you don't really get a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of amenities at all there's no cup holders back here there's no center armrest 
you do at least get some uh, whiplash protection in the form of headrests and shoulder belts so that's nice you know of course safety was uh well <laughs> it was of the time because you, you get one airbag for the driver passenger uh makes do without an airbag and your you know your passive restraints are just those those powered seat belts which you know say say what you want but they met the letter of the law that's for sure you do get a nice uh, moonroof in here and it does work it opens on up no issues with that all the power windows in here still work pretty well actually this interior is big enough that uh, I've actually slept in here on numerous occasions um, I took this to Coachella many years ago and had the seats folded up and and I was able to you know put down a little air mattress and sleep in the back it wasn't wasn't the greatest accommodations that I've ever stayed in but it it was very very livable for uh for a weekend of seeing music out in the desert so can't complain too much about that Ooh, one other thing you do get an ashtray in each door back here so you got that one obviously you got the corresponding one over there for the uh, the other passenger so you know no cup holder but if you'd like to have a smoke you have a way of uh, putting your butt somewhere give you an idea of the trunk size of this thing it's pretty good like I said enough space back here that you know an adult not a not a tall adult but an adult can uh, can sleep here's another interesting feature of these legacies let's get this little uh, storage box here the spare tire is uh just underneath this but this is convenient for keeping oil and and tools and all that kind of junk back here out of the way but easily accessible when you need it and just another quirk to go over about uh old Subarus they they did this probably through probably through like I want to say 2007 on their car so like the the you know the GD Imprezas were probably the last ones to do this but they got this little button here that if you don't know what you're doing and you flick that on and you don't notice that that's on even with no key in the sucker your parking lights are going to be on and you'll run your battery down now it's useful to be able to uh, take your keys with you and have the parking lights stay on and all that in the event that you actually need those lights on but i think more people just uh they just get tripped up and forget that they uh hit that switch or don't even know that they hit that switch and when they come out to a dead battery so Some of these things you just kind of got to be in the know otherwise you're going to get caught off guard as you can see one of the cool features of the uh the european lights is these they call them city lights they're just like these little accent lights that go on inside the headlight they look pretty cool i had to change the wiring up a bit in order to actually get those to function because there's no no wiring for them in the uh, the US market car but it wasn't terribly hard 
and uh, yeah, they look pretty cool.